Donald Trump used to be an abortion rights supporter. He then, right. as he ran for president, you know, got religion on it, so to speak, from the right. Nevertheless, I think some of those instincts kicked in, and he understood that that is, in his words, too harsh. It's not very popular. So this puts him in an interesting position, and the position Donald Trump has decided to take is no position. Abortion is one of the only issues where he definitely and clearly loses to Biden. All right, hello, everyone. I am Sebastian Hughes, and I'm here with Mark Caputo from The Bulwark. The Florida Supreme Court made a ruling yesterday on Monday about abortion and what's going to be on the ballot in November. Can you get into exactly what happened? Yeah, they actually made two rulings on abortion, which is critical to understand. So the first thing they did is they put a citizen-led petition, a proposed constitutional amendment on the ballot, which would legalize abortion before viability. And it doesn't explain what viability is, but generally it's 22 to 24 weeks. Some say 28, but 22 to 24 is, is among the least controversial findings. The other thing they did, the Florida Supreme Court, was strike down prior state Supreme Court precedent that held a privacy amendment in the state constitution did not apply to abortion. Now, prior courts of the Florida Supreme Court, Democratic majority courts, had held, look, this privacy amendment does apply. Therefore, uh, state lawmakers can't really pass abortion restrictions because there's a privacy amendment. And as you know, the federal Roe v. Wade ruling also overturned had a privacy issue involved. Florida Supreme Court said, no, 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 that doesn't apply because when voters voted on that decades ago, there was no talk about abortion, no original intent about abortion. It was about privacy in the technological sense with data, et cetera. So those are the two things. And the effect of removing the privacy amendment ruling or opinion or uh, case law from abortion or separating them is that Florida basically now has a 15-week a limit on abortion, and in 30 days, it will then default to six weeks. Uh, and six weeks of pregnancy, a lot of people, a lot of women don't know they're pregnant. So there's a real tension that's going to be facing Florida voters, which is, look, if you don't pass this amendment, it is a six-week abortion man, period. Now, there's a lot that's vague, uh, especially in the eyes of opponents, about the constitutional amendment that people are going to vote on. But it's pretty clear it's not going to be a six-week abortion ban. It, it would allow uh, for for a lot more leeway. You know, there was a lot of talk about Ron DeSantis and his and the abortion ban, the six-week abortion ban, and mm-hmm. that potentially hurting him in the primary election. So has this election, this ban hasn't gone into effect yet. The the law that everybody has talked about with Ron DeSantis right. and what he signed, none of it has happened yet. And what's about to happen, you said in a couple of weeks, is it will actually go into it. Yeah, it's a, it's a complicated thing. So in 2021, the state legislature and Ron DeSantis signed in the law a, or pardon me, in 2022, I, I, you know, this it, the, the, the years start to blend. They signed in the law an abortion ban of 15 weeks or a limit in 2022. And that was before the U.S. Supreme Court had decided Dobbs, which overturned Roe v. Wade. So then... The U.S. Supreme Court passes Dobbs, strikes down Roe v. Wade. Ron DeSantis running for president at that point, after he wins re-election by a huge margin in 2022, comes back and decides, you know what? We're going to pass another abortion restriction of six weeks. In between that time, opponents of the 15-week limit sued, saying, look, you can't pass an abortion restriction like this because Florida's constitution has this privacy amendment. So it stayed that 15-week abortion limit until the U.S., or better said, the Florida Supreme Court ruled on the privacy amendment. In the meantime, DeSantis and company passed the six-week abortion ban, which said, look, if the the Florida Supreme Court strikes the privacy amendment, the six-week abortion ban will replace the 15-week. So it's all these kind of complicated steps. And... um so <laughs> Republicans don't seem happy about this at all, do they? <laughs> I mean, not particularly. You know, the thing is, is that Republicans control the state legislature, right? right? And state legislatures, regardless of the party, hate citizen initiatives because they're the legislators. They're the legislature. They write the law, you know. And so any citizens let an amendment they just generally hate. And this is one of them. Uh, and... 
there was an argument made yesterday by the outgoing House Speaker, a guy named Paul Renner, that the abortion amendment that voters are going to decide in November is more extreme than the six-week abortion limit. I, I don't really see that, but that's going to be their messaging going forward. I mean, and the reason I don't really see that is, again, with the six-week abortion ban limits you know, abortion, you know, for a period of time, people don't even know they're pregnant. So on one hand, you have a six-week abortion ban that state legislature has passed. On the other hand, you have this constitutional amendment, and the constitutional amendment uh, not only says lawmakers can't ban abortion before viability, it says that an abortion can be performed if a healthcare provider determines it's in sort of the best interest of the patient. Now, notably, uh, the word patient there, the amendment itself was the product of lots of negotiation and focus grouping and polling between progressive, liberal, and women's rights groups. And there were some in this camp that didn't want to use the word women because they thought the word women was exclusionary to trans people. So they said, okay, let's just sidestep that issue and let's just make this about patients, which is also politically smart because the name of the amendment is uh, protecting patients from government interference in abortion. So if you hear the word patient, you hear government interference, it can be potentially appealing to conservative-minded people or libertarian people. Uh, so what you're going to see coming forward or going forward in November is sort of the classic debates that we've seen over abortion. Republicans saying, hey, Democrats want to legalize abortion all the way up to conception. Uh, Democrats saying, no, no, that's a gross uh, exaggeration. Uh, generally speaking, it is a gross exaggeration. You know, there aren't a lot of women who are like, oh, I'm nine months pregnant. You know what? I'm going to check out of this. Right. right. Let's have an abortion. Right. Like generally there are very good reasons and they're not economic. Generally. Even Kellyanne and Conway is uh, going around saying that that's not an argument that should be used anymore. Is uh, well, it's, the... Yeah. Yeah. It just it doesn't make um, it just doesn't make rational sense. Now, there, there are certainly persuasive arguments about these different week levels. And certainly the later on a pregnancy goes, the more in which abortion becomes untenable in the minds of voters. And that's one reason that this constitutional amendment doesn't specify weeks. You know, Florida passed a 15-week abortion ban. Then it did a six-week. So this one comes along. It's like, well, how many weeks? It just says viability. It sidesteps that issue as well. Uh, in part, one of the things that doesn't get written about a lot is about 90, 94% of all abortions in the United States happen within the first 15 weeks. Mm -hmm. Now, privately, uh, President Trump or former President Trump has talked about or made supportive comments about an idea of a federal abortion ban or limit of 15 or 16 weeks. He's never said that publicly, however. Uh, in fact, he's not saying a lot publicly about abortion except for saying, look, I got rid of Roe v. Wade. It's now uh, up to the states. And he's making right. a states' rights issue. So the story I wrote in the bulwark was like, OK, it's a state's rights issue. That's great. President Trump. Or former President Trump. Uh, the question is, is how are you, Florida man, going to vote on this amendment? Because he's actually going to have to fill out a ballot. He's going to presumably vote for himself, right, over Joe Biden in November. There's going to be a constitutional amendment there for him to decide whether or not he thinks a six week abortion ban that currently exists or is about to exist should remain in effect. Or should there be this more uh, vague viability state? Now, one thing that's notable, like last year when I interviewed Donald Trump and I asked him about abortion, you know, he was kind of like kneeling jello to a wall. Very difficult to get a lot of specifics out of him. However, he did say when I, I sort of um, kind of did some lateral movement with him to sort of box him in that a six week abortion ban in Donald Trump's view is, quote, too harsh. Now, in part, that's motivated by the fact that he didn't like Ron DeSantis or Ron DeSantis had signed it. But also, uh, Donald Trump used to be an abortion rights supporter. He then, right. as he ran for president, uh, you know, got religion on it, so to speak, from the right. Nevertheless, I think some of those instincts kicked in, and he understood that that is, in his words, too harsh. It's not very popular. So this puts him in an interesting position, and the position Donald Trump has decided to take is no position. Right. He doesn't want to talk about abortion. If you look at the issue tree of things that are important to voters, abortion is not number one. It's not even number two. It's farther down the list. 
Abortion is one of the only issues where he definitely and clearly loses to Biden. The top issue, inflation in the economy, Donald Trump wins on. Uh, on an almost as highly ranking issue, I don't know if I phrase that properly, immigration, also Donald Trump wins on. So Trump wants to talk about inflation and immigration. Yeah, I want to talk about abortion. How long can he go without giving as the nominee? Oh, is he going to be able to make it to November and not state what type of policy on abortion his administration is going to have if elected? I mean, I mean, how long is he going to go with being indicted four times and having four criminal trials and getting socked with a, a, a sex abuse and uh, repeated defamation civil uh, liability findings from a jury? How long can he... You know, sustain being fined. I guess now it's one hundred seventy-five million dollars. Proposing a one hundred seventy-five million dollar bond for the biggest business fraud or one of the biggest business frauds in New York. I mean, he he continues on. So how long can Donald Trump go without answering this question? You know, he he's he's defied a lot of odds up until this point. So I don't know. I mean, again, I tried to ask him uh, if other people have an opportunity to ask him. I'd love to hear them try. I'd love to hear his response. And what are pro life activists on the right, how have they responded to him not having an opinion on this or not stating his opinion on this? They're not big fans of it. I mean, there's always been this sort of alliance between Donald Trump and the the pro-life community, the anti-abortion community, evangelical voters. He was very transactional, like, look, all these other religious guys, you know, came forward and they didn't deliver and I, I'm going to deliver. And then he delivered. He delivered a U.S. Supreme Court that did what he promised and overturn Roe v. Wade. But no one mistakes Donald Trump for being a particularly religious person. He was a guy who calls 2 Corinthians 2 Corinthians and can't remember his, fa- his favorite bi- Bible verse. And now he's selling well, That's Biden. a very personal question. That's a very personal question. It is, really it is a personal. Yes. Uh, you know, mine's from Job, by the way. Man cometh forth as a flower uh, and is cut down. Uh, but the reality is, is Trump's uh, Trump's alliance with the evangelical community, uh, the the pro-life community, I'm putting that in air quotes, the anti-abortion activists, is still strong because they know he's delivered. And what's interesting is last year, during the presidential primary, when his spokesman said, look, he's not going to take a position on a federal abortion ban, uh, which was proposed by Lindsey Graham, the South Carolina senators, and his ally. Instead, Donald Trump believes this is left up to states because that's what the Dobbs are looking at. Uh, pro-life community, the anti-abortion community, trashed him for it. They're like, how dare he? How could he do that? And then the next thing you know, he invites them down to Mar-a-Lago and charms them. Then they come out of that like, oh, well, so be it. Now their position is, look, we're going to take Donald Trump's lead. And right now, Donald Trump's lead is not to lead. Lastly, Biden's campaign manager uh, uh-huh. said uh, Julie Chavez Rodriguez, she's issued a memo uh, well, hope- yesterday saying that uh, Florida is winnable for Joe Biden. And when in light of this being on the ballot, this uh, amendment being on the ballot on in regards to abortion, uh, is, is Florida winnable for Joe Biden in November? Yeah, I mean, winnable is a very important word there. That is a word of possibility, not probability. You know what else is winnable? Wyoming, Utah. All these other Republican states are winnable states for Joe Biden. Now, some are more winnable than others. And in the list of states that are likely winnable states for Joe Biden, Florida is not one of them. In 2008, with the ascendance of Barack Obama, registered Florida Democrats outnumbered registered Florida Republicans by about 657,000. Today, registered Republicans outnumber registered Democrats in Florida by 850,000. It's a massive shift. In fact, right now, there are fewer registered Democrats in the state of Florida in 2024 than there were in 2008. The party's just completely fallen apart. And one day, if you want to do an entire show for 30 minutes as to why, I'm game. Uh, But suffice it to say, it's a, a complicated situation. Joe Biden's campaign His political operation ever since he got in office was not to build up Florida and to try to build up a bench in Florida, register more voters or pay much attention to it. He's going to pay the price because the likelihood of him winning the state is very, very low. Now, that doesn't mean that 
Joe Biden is going to lose the presidential race. In fact, he's got a great shot. It's essentially a tie race uh, because of these other important swing states, these six other swing states. Florida is no longer a swing state. It's more of a battleground. It's a place where Biden's campaign has to say, well, yeah, you know, Florida's winnable. Of course, they're going to have to say that. Part of the reason they're going to say that is they want to get the activist base excited. And Florida is the third most popular state in the nation. And it's a big place to raise money. So when Joe Biden comes here, it's going to be as much to pretend he's stumping for votes that he's got a real shot at winning as it is to actually draw money out of the state. Don't get me wrong. Republicans do that in California. It just is what it is. But in the end, one of the things that we've seen in Florida over the years is that we have had liberal leaning, progressive, democratic place or whatever the phrase is. I'll, I'll call them left wing just for purposes of the metaphor. OK, okay. amendments, uh, medical marijuana, anti gerrymander, minimum wage increases, two of them. Those have been on the ballot. So left leaning stuff is on the ballot at the same time that Florida voters elect right wing Republican Donald Trump. Marco Rubio, Ron DeSantis, Rick Scott. So there's a history of sort of these crossover voters. Since it takes 60 percent to approve a constitutional amendment, there is a little bit of a danger of Joe Biden making this a over the top partisan issue, because in order for this to pass in a state with the demographics I just mentioned, even you're going to need majority support for from Republicans. And the Republican Party of Florida knows this. They've taken official position over this, and they're going to bombard this with money and try to drag down its poll numbers. What are its poll numbers? Polling about 70 percent, take 60 percent to pass. We've seen in the past with medical marijuana when it initially failed in 2014, that if you have organized partisan opposition, that usually can knock about 10 points off of support for an amendment. So they're basically polling the amendment supporters for abortion right where they need to be. Uh, I'm not predicting it's going to pass. I'm not predicting... It's uh, going to lose. Uh, well, that was my next question. That was know. my final question, yeah. Mark. Is if you I had to gun to your head, you had to say which is going to happen. All I right. don't know. This is this is different from others because you have that sort of Damocles of a six week abortion ban. I think there are going. While I think it's unlikely Joe Biden wins in Florida, I think there's a likelier chance that the abortion amendment passes. And that's because there are going to be a lot of people, and especially women. Republican women are going to go in that voting booth and they'll be like, you know what? This is too much for me. I can't do this. And the advantage of having constitutional amendments like this or initiatives is a voter can pick and choose. Hey, I can get my Donald Trump and I can like reduce the pressure and back off of like kind of the right wing uh, abortion restrictions in the state. Thank you so much, Mark. I'm sure you will be paying close attention to how this plays out. And I look forward to reading and to potentially hearing more about it from you. Thanks, Sebastian. Appreciate it.